first contact. The louder you scream, the longer this takes. You're listening to a podcast from the spoilist.com. Welcome to First Contact, a beginner's guide to Star Trek The Next Generation. Unfortunately, that beginner has now lost the will to live and has gone to watch Babylon 5. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This time, we have been watching The Drumhead. It was written by Jerry Taylor and directed by Jonathan Frakes. It first aired the week of April 29th, 1991. James, what happens in this one? Following a minor explosion in the warp core, a Klingon exchange officer is found to have been working with the Romulans and sending them classified information. However, he denies sabotaging the warp core. Suspecting a conspiracy on board, Starfleet sends the legendary retired Admiral Nora Sarti on board to investigate. While she and Picard work well together, Soon she and her staff begin to use underhand tactics to gather intel, make unfounded accusations and create connections to imply guilt before opening up the interrogations to the public. When Picard objects, he is put on the stand, but can he make a big speech which stops the witch hunt while drawing parallels with history and our contemporary situation? You bet he can. Alex? You'd never seen this episode before. What were your thoughts? Have I seen it now? I'm I'm still not 100% sure that I have. Um, well, it's certainly an episode, isn't it? Um, this, this is a really good episode. Oh, it's not... Okay, let me qualify. It's not bad. It absolutely isn't bad. It's just uh, a bit dull. I mean, inside baseball... We double bank these episodes. We record two in one night, and it's always the case that the second episode that we watch is the harder one to do because your attention span is more limited. So when the first episode that we did was last week was the romp of Cupid, to go into this uh, really sort of saps your batteries. Uh, and and weirdly, I I would kind of think that wouldn't be the case because. There are certain parallels to where we are currently, potentially, uh, in in the world of politics. As we record this now, uh, he says, horrendously dating the podcast, uh, the articles of impeachment for Trump's second impeachment are being delivered, and we're rapidly heading towards the trial. So it, it, it it's relevant to where we are currently, I guess. And I've been so invested in the news during lockdown because there's not a lot else to do. It should enthrall me more than it does, but I did kind of switch off during it, I'll be honest. I think what this episode is, it's a play. And it's a play done in Star Trek The Next Generation. And so... Does it feel dynamic? It's... No, maybe not, but I, I, I'm all in favour of this kind of episode. I think episodes where people just sit in rooms and talk are what Star Trek The Next Generation is all about. I would say that perhaps unusually, it doesn't feel like that much of a science fiction episode. I, I think that mm. there's some of this with some of the early episodes of Star Trek, the original series as well, something like court martial where it is something that could be done in any show so sure you have the Klingon in this episode who is using a high tech way of transmitting messages it's being encoded into proteins and then injected into a bloodstream that's cool but actually you could you could change that to some kind of way of sending code out or code machine and this episode could be set during the second world war or it could be set during McCarthyism, or it it could be at the Salem Witch Trials, because it is, it is a variation on the Crucible. I don't think there's any getting away from that. No. But that said, I, I think it it's I think it's it's pretty strong stuff. And as you say, not just the Trump stuff, but also the like the, the QAnon stuff, the the building yeah. the conspiracy from the barest of facts making the connections between things just just to suit your argument. I, I think 
that there is a lot of interesting stuff in contemporary politics w- within this episode. And I think it's a fairly effective bottle show. I think I'd rather have this than than Jordy and Deanna are stuck in a turbo lift together. Yeah, I, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I would say that there are parts of the show where I was very invested. Uh, it's just that it, that wasn't a continuous state that I sort of flitted in and out a bit. Um, so, but by, by the time we get to the end, the the final court sequence, I I think that's that's good. I mean, it gets it it, it goes a little overboard perhaps and starts to 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 dive off the deep end but mostly it, it's quite good but there there are other bits where it, yeah I'm not so invested I wasn't massively invested in the Klingon plot it's it's weird with courtrooms there's that that adage of the minute you have to put a show uh do a, a courtroom season or whatever uh is when the show's in trouble. And that's an adage that's been used for things like like Doctor Who when you're putting the show on trial itself. Which is kind of what they're doing here because they're putting Captain Picard's actions on trial. Uh, weirdly, that's the bit I'm more invested in in this. Uh, uh, and I... Maybe, maybe I, w- I would... I just want to see a little more of... I'm a little more time spent on that rather than the sort of... Conspiracy angle. Basically, I was more interested in the fake conspiracy than any kind of actual conspiracy. Well, that that's where the threat comes from. The fact that we we know Picard is not part of some huge conspiracy. So suddenly, the yeah. admiral is the bad guy. But I think that they're very smart. In if this were a season one or two episode, we would have had that sting over the admiral when she arrived. So we know she's the bad guy. From the get-go, there would have been no illusions about why she's there. She's there to drum up trouble and find a conspirator, whether there is actually a conspiracy or not. Whereas here, the the being a bit smarter about it, the letting the audience feel that they can trust this admiral because Picard trusts her, and then turning that on its head. The only thing is that I never trust her. Uh, well, in Star Trek, you don't really trust admirals, do you? No, and I mean that—that that, I think you're right. I think that is part of the problem. Is that uh, when you say that we know that Picard's infallible? Yeah, that's that's what makes that interesting. Whereas some kind of conspiracy element, or well, not even necessarily conspiracy, but Klingon acting undercover. Well, we've we've seen that several times before now, um, so you kind but of. But that, that was only a very small element at the beginning. The whole point was it then moves on to there is a conspirator working with the Klingon on board ship. Oh, I know, but my my point is that um, this is kind of linking into what I was saying. I was more invested later on in the episode because of that element being the element that was up front it hadn't grabbed me at the start so it took me much longer to really become invested if if you see what i mean at the start it feels like run of the mill now subverting it is is no bad way to go uh but i don't know it just it didn't quite work as well as i feel it should have done and maybe it is that fact that the minute the admiral turns up because of how we know admirals are in tng and wider star trek don't trust her from the minute she arrives. You you also have this element of the accused being more sympathetic n- no matter what. So when you have the the medical technician who has the, the Romulan heritage, I, I think it is made out in the script for them to be very nervous. And even if they're hiding something, they seem naive and innocent there, there's never any question i don't think that they are a conspirator and therefore you know when they're going after them aggressively when they are using the the betazoid in order to say they're hiding something which again hiding something never a crime i, I think that's something that comes up in, in star trek again 
that you're kind of on their their side the side of the individual rather than the investigation whereas i don't know if if a little bit more ambiguity about it might have might have made the plot more involving because again the the explosion in the warp core it's this was this an accident was this sabotage and then it it doesn't it, obviously that's the catalyst for the investigation but i don't think it takes too long for them to go oh no it it was it was just a, an accident oops it was a huge coincidence isn't it that there was a klingon conspirator on board ship at the same time there was an accident in the warp core yeah i mean that's that is not ideal when you've got a spy on board and again <laughs> We, we've we've been through this before they're terrible with security protocols on the enterprise like anyone is given access to anything they want and therefore when there is a breach when people do download things you're like yeah because you've given them free reign of the ship a ship which children run around the bridge at points so that was that was in early seasons but it just seems like if someone's on board they can ask the computer for anything, they can access anything, and it's only if something comes up that's suspicious that they even bother to ask them. Well, it's a good thing that that's fictional and there's no parallels in real life. Say, for example, some uh, people from some right-wing militias seemingly having been allowed to tour the US Capitol a few days before an insurrection, and in in fact led around by uh, freshman senators. He was part of the Klingon exchange program. Why wouldn't they be able to trust a Klingon from the Klingon Empire who are the Federation's allies? God, the Klingons arranging that exchange program must go, what, another one? God, why is it only ever the traitors that want to do it? (laughs) Just once you think we could find a nice lad. (laughs) So, like, what, what do you think of the 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 character of Admiral Sati, this this great admiral who and they tie it back again to that season one conspiracy. She was apparently played a big part in in uncovering that within the Federation, which is a, a, a nice a nice touch. But I was going to ask, uh, did, did she crop up in that episode? Because I've I've no memory. No, no, right, okay. <laughs> she was um, definitely there. She was just around the corner. My girlfriend, you haven't met her. We met on holiday. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm quite happy for them to bring that in for context. That uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, it's fine. It's another bit of world building in establishing her as a good guy. You know, she helped Picard and Riker that day to save the Federation. So we should be on her side. We should, but again, even. People Picard has history with, well, I say even, most of the time they tend to be untrustworthy. So, I again, I, st- I don't believe any of it from the minute she arrives. <laughs> when when has an old friend of Picard's turned up and not had something wrong with them? I think this this is just showing the, the, the versatility of Star Trek Next Generation. If you think what the kinds of shows we've had this season, even... The previous episode to this, they're having a romp in Sherwood Forest. And here they're doing a very serious play about conspiracies and interrogation techniques and, and human rights. And it, it feels very Star Trek to me. This is this is so Star Trek The Next Generation, this episode. Maybe a little too much. It, 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 was, it was the bottle show and it was the money saver, originally conceived as a clip show. And I think you can see elements of that in the Picard. Yeah. You did this, this and this. And thank goodness they didn't do that because very rarely does that work but you know this this is a show that is saying we've got no money we've got no effects all we can use are those standard shots of the enterprise flying through space so we're going to sit in one room and chat let's make it interesting but we've already done the measure of a man and we can't possibly make it that good so we'll we'll try a spin on something familiar and this is why it would never happen now, because Star Trek now has Netflix paying six million dollars for each episode for some reason, so they can have a 
billion ships explode and 4,000 planets die in a second. I, I, I guess the other major thread in this is Worf. So he he is basically becomes the henchman. It's these methods are effective, Mr. Worf. Would you like to join us? Would you like to find out? Would you like to help the Federation and stop the Romulan Klingon threat? We'll will restore the honor of your name in the in the Federation. I think it's a, it's a good use of Worf in this. And I don't even think they mention the fact that his parents were killed by Romulans. No, but it. it it plays into his character. He hates Romulans. We know why he hates Romulans. So, even discounting that, we know he's more authoritarian minded. You know, he's the first one to suggest to Picard that maybe they should raise the shields and arm the photon torpedoes. So, it, it's, it's great character work. And there is also the element that Worf every time he makes a suggestion in Star Trek The Next Generation, which is usually the the most aggressive one, Picard just says, no, we're not going to do that, Mr. Worf. And then he's met an authority figure that says, no, we are going to go with your suggestions. You you, you found the, the clue. You found the magic hypo spray. We're going we're gonna to use your methods and we're going to teach you some of our methods. So I think as, as a character beat, that really makes sense and I, I guess he's the one who in the end learns his lesson and says oh I thought they were a great person so yeah I think that is all pretty effective as well again it's not it's not massively dramatic but at times competent writing and a nice little arc is enough especially as that's barely even a b-plot and it, it is refreshing that it all has to be in a room it, it's not lives at stake. It's not this planet is going to be destroyed if we don't get this right. It, it's not even this ship is going to be destroyed. It's some people talking in a room and that is what is at stake. I think the other thing is the, the use of a, a betazoid in... As, a, as an interrogation technique. Uh, and they have the discussion with Picard, which says, w- would you not listen to your counsellor if she told you something useful? And he goes, it's, it's just never happened yet. I mean, it, it's, it's, not, it's not come up. But uh, I think that's quite interesting. It, 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 it is almost, in some ways, a, an unethical way to, to interrogate something. A, a lie detector in some ways, but but more than that, an invasion, you might say, or a sort of psychic invasion. And I think that, that I guess, is the one decent science fiction element in this because it, it does feel very contemporary in a lot of ways. But at least that's there to, to make it stand out in this world and examine another aspect of the show. And it puts Picard on the back foot because he, he is a bit of a hypocrite, really. He's happy to use Troy to, to, in a way, use some sort of an invasive technique. We've talked about it with Loaxana Troy when she reads people's minds without their consent. And, you know, is the use of Troy the 24th century equivalent of waterboarding? <laughs> Well, I've certainly seen some Troy-centric episodes of the show that have made me feel like I've had a flannel placed across my face and a bucket of water played to simulate drowning, yes. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that they're torturing people, but they're using immoral means to gain information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sort of sums up the feelings, really. I mean, it's... It's a worthy episode. It's just, I guess, I guess when you dig under the skin of it, there's not a huge amount there. the The idea of uh, uh, seeing monsters in the shadows that aren't there uh, politically is is an interesting one. One that, sadly, as we see at the moment, certainly doesn't go away. 
uh, uh, you only have to look at how how often the the right keep talking about uh, Antifa invaders as if you know they exist. Um, but I don't know. I, I just it doesn't feel greater than the sum of its parts. I guess. And I think you're right when you say you're interested in the Picard stuff and Picard being put on trial. Because actually, up to that point, there are no personal stakes in this episode. No. There's there's not there's not even the threat of, Picard, you'll get your commands taken away from you. And whereas in The Measure of a Man, the stakes are personal, but they are very high. It is the life of an individual and indeed the rights of a, an entire race of beings and there there is that nice parallel now here you obviously have the the witch hunts in the background of this episode but you do not have any personal stakes this isn't about one of our characters really so you've got tarsis who is who is the the crewman but i i do think you you don't want it to to always center around you know a a personal story and we've got a personal connection to the bigger thing but i think in this when it is a small scale trial that is the perfect opportunity to examine one of our characters in more detail and most likely it should be picard but that comes in very late in the episode and because he is unimpeachable basically it doesn't really work because he can deliver that great speech about rights which which is which is all very good, but it does seem like a bit of a, a cheap way out of it at the end because Starfleet has gone this way and then where I am going to to provoke the woman into being hysterical by talking about her father. It's a, it's a difficult one because, I mean, the end of that trial where she gets so worked up, I mean, that's kind of where it's leading to, but I, I don't know if it's a completely dramatically satisfying end to it because... She sort of undermines herself, but does she? I mean, she. What was the line? I've taken down bigger men than you, or something on those lines. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't. Does that devalue really what she's been saying? To say that, not necessarily. It might imply that you, again, seeing uh, monsters in the shadows that aren't there, but. It doesn't completely describe. I, I I feel like we were missing the completely satisfying debunking. I did love the look on the admiral's face as he just quietly left the room. I mean, I mean, maybe maybe we have been spoiled currently uh, with the the wealth of these types of figures who have been richly humiliating themselves on the public stage since November. Uh, I mean, this is no Four Seasons total landscaping, is is basically what I'm saying. Uh, maybe maybe just watching this at the time we are watching this now, it, it, it pales in comparison to actual current events. That seems like a good conclusion. It's as good as you're going to get. <laughs> well, let's see if there's, there's any exciting trivia in Quickfire. Quickfire. This is one of my favourite facts. The interrogation room, which was last seen in The Defector, is actually a redress of the Enterprise Bridge from Star Trek The Motion Picture. And that kind of makes me a little sad that it's ended up like that. It's the most interesting thing about the episode. They've got to, they've got to save money, they've got to reuse sets. I know, but that set... I mean, it's not exactly iconic, but... It was important in its own way. It's not the original series set, is it? Which probably was destroyed. Yeah, I mean, it definitely was. You'll be surprised to hear that Memory Beta has nothing on the future of Nora Sati. She doesn't get assimilated by the Borg and become the Borg Queen, or she doesn't join the Maquis and become a terrorist. However, the Betazoid Genestra... He would go on to inspect the Enterprise E along with three other inspectors following the events of Star Trek Nemesis. And he would recommend that they give the Enterprise a pass. 
fascinating as ever. So, as ever, let's browse the ball-breaking banality of uh, Star Trek The Netpicker's Guide. Um, Phil struggles to get much out of this episode, much as we do. He only manages one page, three quarters of which is taken up with the plot, which, frankly, if, I, if I'd gone out and spent seven ninety nine on a book of nitpicking, uh, I would be mightily pissed off if three quarters of that was just recounting exactly what happened in the episode but uh, never mind um not really much no equipment oddities no continuity problems uh just one section uh, of plot oversights uh, bear in mind that's plot oversights uh where his point is does exobiology sound like a believable occupation for a klingon well, I don't know, Phil. Does uh, Chief Nitpicker sound like uh, an appropriate title for yourself? Because that is the title you have afforded yourself at the back of the book. Um, we've gone 259 pages into this book, but it's never occurred to me before to actually look at the back, uh, which is a fascinating insight in itself, uh, where he provides his address and suggests that you send in your nitpicks... Uh, and if you do, your entry will make you an official member of the Nitpickers Guild. I mean... Can, can who, we do that, please? <laughs> who wouldn't want that title on their gravestone? Uh, he does, however, put a, a legal disclaimer at the bottom, uh, which says, Note, all submissions become property of Phil Farrand and will not be returned. I mean, God, what would I do without my submission? Uh, submissions may or may not be acknowledged by submitting material. You grant permission for the use of your submission and name in future publication. Uh, should a given mistake be published in one of the mediums of the Nitpickers Guide, an effort will be made to credit you. However, Phil Farrand makes no guarantee that any such credit will be given. So, sounds to me, Phil, like you're just going to take people's submissions and put them in a book without saying who they came from. And now I'm questioning 259 pages of lies. We believed in you, Phil. I, I want to send something to that address. I doubt he lives there, but... <laughs> Forward this. <laughs> Worf would be swayed by authoritarian means in the terrible Deep Space Nine episode Let He Who Is Without Sin, where he jo joins an extremist group on Ryza who are against fun. It's rubbish. But he does tip over a table of Hogans. Uh, Jonathan Frakes named this episode as one of his favourites because he loved working with Gene Simmons. I've always thought she was arguably the classiest, most significant actor we had on the series. She was wonderful in the scenes with Patrick and she was still so gorgeous. Now, if you don't know, she was one of J. Arthur Rank's well-spoken young starlets and appeared in a huge number of films in the 50s and 60s, including Elmer Gantry, The Robe, Guys and Dolls, um, and the happy ending for which she was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actress. So, there you go. I mean, that, that line by Jonathan Frakes, still so gorgeous. It just doesn't sit right, really. <laughs> Yeah, a long time extra, Ensign Kellogg is finally named in this episode during Worf's briefing with his security officers. Ensign Kellogg, played by Cameron. Right. It's it's an actress who just has the name Cameron. She Cameron would go on to appear as a trill in Star Trek The Experience. She she would also play a hand double for Denise Crosby. Um, in what? <laughs> in, in a future episode of Star Trek: The Next Thank Generation. Thank God for that. Sp Cause, spoilers. Because <laughs> I'm I'm fairly certain that she did some other films. <laughs> we'll be back again, and we'll be talking about Half a Life. So I hope you'll join us for that. But for now, goodbye. 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 Uh, 
And this is why it would never happen now. Because Star Trek now has Netflix paying $6 million for each episode for some reason. So they can have a billion ships explode and 4,000 planets die in a second. The episode ends with the Admiral just getting worked up in the trial and going, Yeah, well, what do you say about my father? Picard, you're just a... a, a you know that's gonna happen. That's, that, that's where the cards headed. Yeah. 